Hi, uh, welcome back from the poster session. I am thrilled to announce uh, for our final keynote, we have Paul Debevic. He's a senior staff scientist at Google Research, and he's also an adjunct research professor at the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies. Uh, and creative technologies really gives you a good idea of what his work is all about. He does amazing things at the intersection of cutting edge technology and the arts. So uh, Paul is a computer scientist with multiple Academy Awards uh, because his research on topics like HDR imaging, uh, image-based lighting, and photoreal digital actors has been used to create uh, memorable effects in movies that you have probably seen, uh, like The Matrix, Avatar, Gravity, uh, The New Blade Runner, Benjamin Button, Gemini Man, Spider-Man 2, and Furious 7. Uh, you may also know him from his 3D portrait of Barack Obama. So you've probably encountered Paul's work in some form or another, uh, and we're really delighted to have him here today, uh, closing out our workshop by sharing his experience uh, and perspective on the key technologies uh, that make the magic happen. So thank you so much, Paul, for being here. Take it away. Thank you so much, Emma. It's great to be here at Computational Cameras and Displays. Thanks for making it back for the super, from the cool, super cool poster session there. Great work going on. Uh, this is a special day. It's not just Father's Day uh, on, on June 20th. It actually happens to be the, the five-year anniversary of when I joined uh, Google. And um, I have uh, previously been full-time for 16 years at the USC Institute for Creative Technologies, where I'm now a, uh, uh, an adjunct faculty member and uh, enjoy getting to, to continue to work with their light stage and, and, and their researchers. Um, and this journey to Google actually came about through virtual reality and, in fact, through computational imaging. Um, uh, this particular slide uh, that I had as part of a talk uh, at a Stanford um, workshop on light field imaging uh, ended up being kind of uh, prophetic. Uh, the, uh, the organizers of the, of the Cyan workshop, uh, Joyce Farrell in particular, decided to do a light field imaging session, and it was happening in early 2015, kind of at the very beginning of the crazed hype about virtual reality. And so I gave a talk about, you know, a number of light field related stuff that I'd done over the years, but it just didn't feel like I could make a complete talk without somehow saying like, well, how do light fields have something to do with virtual reality? Because everyone's talking about virtual reality right now. And so I worked with uh, Jay Bush uh, in my uh, group, our technical artist, to put together this diagram of what I thought would be a good, you know, virtual reality camera if you wanted to shoot light field video that you would watch in a VR headset. And the idea of shooting light field video uh, instead of just regular 360 video or 360 stereo video is that, you know, you should be able to move your head around a little bit and see the perspective on the scene change as you move your head forward and back and left and right and up and down. Uh, not just so that it's like a little bit more immersive, but so that, you know, the natural amount that we're just always moving our head around anyway and we can't really avoid, even if you just like turn your head to the side, your eyeballs translate over there too. Um, and if you don't see the 3D parallax effects that you should, um, it's a strange cue. It makes a lot of people, including me, feel sick to their stomach. So if we wanted VR to like, you know, really take off, then how, how can we do that? Well, I thought, well, you know what we should do? We should just build an array of cameras capture all the rays of light coming into this, you know, I don't know, almost one meter sphere that you might want to look at with your light field, come up with new view interpolation algorithms and new ways of rendering this in real time. And then as you move around, you could watch light field video and it would be fantastic. And I kind of hinted at the fact that this was probably going to be about five years of work to really figure it all out. Um, based on this, I kind of got contacted by, you know, Google's VR group and said they be kind of interested in doing this, this kind of stuff. And in June of 2016, I found myself working at Google with, in fact, Jay Bush and two other members of my team from USC and finding that we had marching orders to do light field stuff. And we wanted to get started quickly. This looked like a little bit of a system to engineer. So some of the, I, I thought I'd show some of the very early experiments that we did. And one of them was based on this thing I'd seen in, in the Boston airport and Logan airport going through. Um, where it's just kind of an array of mirrors that happen to uh, converge in a way that if you stand in just the right spot and take a selfie, you get a legitimate light field of yourself with a single camera. Uh, it's not a very wide field of view because it's just like, you know, almost an orthographic view you get standing so far away from here. Um, but I thought that 
this was nice because if you just shot video of this, you'd get light field video and you wouldn't have to worry about hooking up a bunch of cameras and synchronizing them, which is, which is a, a big ordeal. So I, I found that um, you can actually get these mirrors that are slightly concave. And if you look at them from a distance, you see about a 45 degree field of view. You can get them for about $2 each. So we actually 3D printed out these uh, brackets that um, could angle the mirrors in just a little bit so that they'd reconverge on a, on a subject. And we thought we'd shoot our first light field video this way. And uh, since uh, the Los Angeles YouTube space was just across the street from us, working at, at Google down here in Los Angeles, um, they had done something kind of fun for the 2016 election, which is they had uh, taken one of their sound stages and they just hired some um, uh, set designers to build a replica of the Oval Office so that any YouTube stars who wanted to broadcast live from the Oval Office um, could uh, do that for their YouTube videos. And so we got to take over the Oval Office for a bit. This is uh, Graham Fife, who also came over with us from uh, USC. And uh, we uh, thought it would be fun to shoot some, uh, like a light field presidential uh, address there. So you can see the mirror array uh, over here at the side. And um, this is actually a, a red uh, digital cinema camera that I think it was at least 6K, maybe it was 8K resolution, but the idea was that even though these images are small, you'd still get pretty good resolution with the RED camera. So here's a little video of actually kind of setting that up and uh, using it. I'm pressing record, and then Graham's getting ready to address the light field there. Graham's actually Canadian. Stabilize and go ahead. So in an earlier clip, he called himself the Prime Minister. I had to kind of work with him on that a little bit. But uh, we got some light field video, and it was kind of, it was kind of fun. Um, we uh, uh, worked on um, uh, uh, kind of processing it. We just had very basic view interpolation algorithms back then. It didn't quite get to the point where the resolution really impressed the, 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 you know, the, the, what we were hoping for in terms of what we could do with, uh, with, with light field video. So we kind of kept that on the shelf for a bit. Um, and we realized that if we wanted to get somewhat higher resolution, maybe we could focus on still scenes and just move a single camera around. So this was another little test that we did in the Oval Office with just kind of a single uh, fisheye view. This is a, a Kodak Pix Pro camera. And we just rotated it around. Every time it rotated around, that tripod has a little crank on it. And I'd sit under the tripod and lower it by about five centimeters. And we would get these cylindrical light fields. So that gave us some light field data to start playing with as early as 2016. And uh, based on some of those experiments, we kind of upped our game a little bit and finally built a uh, camera that we actually really did use in production that we called the GoPro Oddity rig. This was based on a Jump Odyssey 360 stereo camera that uh, folks in the uh, Seattle team uh, had built. And they had actually worked with GoPro to put a very tight synchronization mechanism between all of the cameras for shooting 360 video. And what we did is we unwrapped these GoPros into an arc and put a motor on him. Uh, the uh, uh, fourth person who had joined uh, Xu Ming Yu over from USC built the uh, the drivetrain for the mechanics here. Jay Bush did a lot of the um, laser cutting and 3D printing. In about 30 seconds, this thing would rotate around. Here's a long exposure photo. And you would get your spherical light field pretty quickly that way. And that was just fast enough that we could actually record light fields you know, all throughout a space. We did Space Shuttle Discovery uh, at the Smithsonian Museum. And we could even do some light field portraits of people. These are some local artists who have decorated their house with a lot of um, uh, tile mosaic. And uh, we actually got a nice portrait of them. And using some work that we published at Sergraph Asia 2018, we um, are able to do light field rendering. We, we compute like a depth map for each one of these approximately 1,000 views that we have on the sphere. And then there's kind of like a big advanced bilinear view dependent texture mapping of the image data onto this local geometry that you have per view. And it produces quite high quality uh, light field reconstructions. It also gets things like, you know, 
reflections, for example. So if you see the window back here, there's pretty convincing kind of rough specular reflections that you would expect to see as you move back and forth in this light field reconstruction. And if you have access to a VR headset that connects to a computer, I highly recommend checking this out for yourself on your uh, Vive or your Oculus Rift or your Windows Mixed Reality. Uh, for free, you can download this app called Welcome to Light Fields on Steam VR, and it will take you through about 36 uh, light field static uh, scenes, including that space shuttle tour, some architectural tours, and you'll get to meet uh, Sherry and Gonzalo and feel like you're, you're sitting right across from them. And that taught us a lot uh, about what it takes to produce compelling light field content in terms of like how close objects should be able to come to you, what field of view you need, what kind of image resolution you need. And we took all of that into consideration as we continued to move our work further forward uh, to get to light field video, which was really the big prize we were after. And one of the things that we realized is that encoding all of the individual in, uh, image streams and their computed depth maps, uh, it was going to be too much data to encode. And we had to figure out a way to create something that was more of a, a consistent distillation of one scene representation that brought in the data from all the cameras and didn't try to stream and represent all of that in a compressed form as it goes to rendering. And that became the basis of what we called our deep view video uh, pipeline. This is based on a scene representation called multiplane images, which is some work led by John Flynn in our group that represents the scene around you as a set of RGB alpha planes. And it uses deep learning to figure out what set of RGB alpha planes and what pixel colors to put on them will represent all of the original input views and also be very likely to produce correct view interpolations for what you would have seen in between the cameras to generate those rays of the light field that you need. So there's a website that you can see there. There'll be a QR code for that in a little bit um, where you can see some of the video that we've produced and to apply it to virtual reality where we wanted at least 180 degrees field of view we adapt this, this uh, through some work that uh, some other folks, including Michael Broxton, who came on, our first author, uh, to be able to put it onto spherical shells so that these planes can now curve and surround you with the uh, video. If you go to that site, you can also just see this stuff live in your web browser because it's compact enough to do that. And if we look at this video, then we should be able to see uh, an example here of, uh, this is our friend, uh, Libor, who has a neat workshop, and we're just virtually moving the viewpoint around. This is our artist in residence, Alexa Mead, that we worked with, painting a person. This is a nice volumetric effect that uh, Libor uh, uh, set off for him in, in his garage, which was kind of a target-rich environment for cool things to look at. And you can see we can um, move the camera viewpoint around pretty convincingly for this about one meter view, viewing volume. Here's Alexa doing some painting in the Playa Vista Google office. She, she liked the depth maps that we were computing, so she made a whole art installation that you can immerse yourself in that's based on her interpretation of our depth maps and also their stereo reconstruction artifacts, which she was a particular fan of. This is our program manager, Peter Denny, making friends with a horse. This is one of our technical videographer collaborators, Matthew Duvall, playing with his dog. And uh, there, there's quite a bit of this stuff here that you can see in the, in the VR demos. Let's go a little bit forward. And we'll take a look at the camera array. So we were very lucky that um, one of the um, kind of uh, competitors to GoPro called Yi, Y-A-Y-I, they came up with one version of their 4K camera that could take a sync signal in. So you could start them all by pressing one record button. And we made this like thin acrylic hemisphere that's about 80, 90 centimeters in diameter. We cut holes in it and we attached a whole bunch of these Yi 4K cameras all wired up with their micro USB cable. Unfortunately, they take a, a hard to find version of the micro USB that has a sixth pin for sync. They didn't 
keep completely compatible with that. But we were able to put that together. And when we record, we get these 46 synchronized videos. And the goal of our CNN is to turn it into this multi-plane image or actually multi-sphere image so that if you stack these front to back, it reconstructs the scene, including things flying through with sparks, good alpha edges uh, and occlusions. And a bit of reconstruction of specular reflections, even though the representation doesn't explicitly represent specular reflections, it um, can kind of fake those by putting little bright spots in the scene behind the surfaces that they're supposed to be reflecting off of and making those surfaces a little bit transparent. So you might notice some specularities in some of these scenes. And then this, this last bit of the video that we've just seen here, I'll, I'll run this again, actually uh, takes it down. You can see that was like about uh, 120 layers to get this kind of quality. That was too much for us to compress and stream into a reasonable file format. So instead, um, we run another post-processing algorithm that tries to group surfaces in the scenes into a total of 16 uh, depth mapped, texture mapped layers. And we found that 16 layers will kind of compress into a texture atlas movie that we can do okay as a, like a 4K by 4K map. Uh, and it still represents the scene pretty effectively. So we're gonna see a comparison here between using this layered mesh representation and the original multi-sphere image. That's like 16 layers with depth versus 128 layers with just fixed depth. And then this is a nice visualization that um, Matthew did for showing how it turns into a texture atlas. So basically our light field video is like this texture atlas movie. There's also an alpha channel that goes along with this too that looks similar to black and white. And, um, and then some rough 3D geometry uh, that's compressed with polygons and vertices. And that produced a, a, uh, a, a pretty good a light field video experience. And if you go to our Deep View video site, which I'll show the link for one more time, there is a downloadable version of these videos that you can watch in a VR headset on your, uh, on your PC if it's hooked up there. So we've continued to try to um, uh, improve what we're doing uh, in this area. And, you know, based on the success of our, we call that the Sentinel rig because, you know, it, it kind of like had lots of eyes and wires coming off the back. Um, we thought we should go a little bit higher quality with things that we might have uh, a bit um, more success with. And the poster that I just presented in the poster session talks about our latest light field camera called Brutus. And the design goals for, for Brutus were to shoot hemispherical light field video with somewhat higher resolution, somewhat higher reliability, uh, and certainly better image quality so that, for example, we could set all the cameras to the same amount of um, uh, uh, exposure and not just have them all be on auto exposure, which is kind of problematic for a lot of immersive scenes. Uh, we still wanted to be able to capture subjects from one meter to infinity, um, to uh, have people move their head around a meter in the scene, and we're willing to spend like maybe $50,000 on components for this one here. So up by a factor of 10, but not by a factor of 100 from our previous one. And the cameras that we found were Zcam E2s. It's kind of like a compact uh, digital cinema camera. Uh, they're almost 4K by 3K resolution. They'll record at 60 frames per second. They have some nice video codecs that uh, have logarithmic compression or 10-bit uh, or 12-bit or so you can get better dynamic range. And we put a whole bunch of lenses on them that were 190 degrees field of view each. So you basically see everything that's in front of the hemisphere. Uh, we went with another acrylic hemisphere. We had a thicker one because we had uh, uh, heavier cameras. And we arranged them basically like in a, a little ring of three in the middle, surrounded by a ring of nine, surrounded by a ring of 12. And you know, even the cameras on that 12 ring there still look straight forward because they have a 190 degree field of view. Uh, on the lenses, and then um, Jay came up with these very nice custom 3D prints to hold the cameras onto the structure, uh, and uh, they were all attached to the dome using a custom jig that she built to, to, drill, uh, to drill into the dome and get them in the right places. And the dome itself was reinforced with some aluminum uh, struts so that it was solid enough, but the, the half-inch thick acrylic was, was 
pretty, pretty solid. And what we've been doing during the pandemic uh, is actually recording uh, some light field video content, some immersive light field video, uh, mostly friends of mine in my backyard. Um, and this includes uh, my friend Andrew, who plays bagpipes. He actually serenaded people in Santa Monica uh, every evening during the pandemic and got written up in newspapers about that. He did a special concert for us. We interviewed our artist in residence, Alexa Mead, uh, actually at her apartment, which is beautifully decorated with lots of colorful materials and different reflectance properties and rainbows streaming through prisms in the afternoon. So we captured that and interviewed her about her work. Uh, my friend Chishuan Yang played the, uh, the, the Chinese Erhu uh, violin uh, for us. Um, and uh, two actor friends of, of mine, Derek and Amanda, actually custom wrote a, uh, a little comedy sketch uh, specifically for, for light field enjoyment. And uh, we're currently working on uh, uh, processing uh, this data. And we also hope like some of our other data that's available on our Deep View video site there, there's the link, and there's a QR code for that. Um, you can currently download some data with our Sentinel rig. Uh, watch this space. We, we have hopes to be able to release uh, some of these experiences and some of the, the high quality light field data to go uh, along with that. So that's been one of the big threads of work that I've been involved in, in in Google for the last five years, but there have been others. Uh, they also involve lighting, um, but not specifically virtual reality. And another big interest at Google has been augmented reality, including things that you can see in uh, the AR Core um, uh, API that you have with um, the Pixel phones and Android phones. And when we think of augmented reality, a lot of people were kind of introduced to its possibilities through um, Pokemon Go, which is sort of fun. Um, it kind of rendered these little Pokemons onto your video feed, uh, but I don't think it was really fooling anyone that the Pokemons were really there. Certainly the camera tracking was one issue, but another thing was lighting the Pokemons. Like if you're gonna put a Pokemon into this park, it should look lit like it's lit by the light of the park. and you know, the bar has been raised considerably higher than that from the kind of visual effects that we see in movies with image-based lighting technology. Um, here's a, a rendering from the, uh, the recent Pokemon movie, and you can see they're, they're much better integrated into this street scene than what we're, what we're used to and the, uh, through augmented reality. And the reason for that is that, you know, visual effects artists actually captured a high dynamic range image of the scene uh, that they're being rendered into, and they lit the characters with the lighting that was actually there in the scene. This is something that we started having fun in, with in our research group even back in the 1990s when I was going around UC Berkeley and capturing the light of the, the eucalyptus grove or on my trip to go visit Stanford's Digital Michelangelo Project, I took a couple of photos in St. Peter's Basilica in high dynamic range to capture its lighting and to try to uh, use that for a film uh, that we made. And you can get some very convincing results of showing what those objects look like in those scenes. Doing that on a cell phone is of course gonna be a little bit more challenging because you have a lot less information to work with. You don't have your personal visual effects crew going out there with mirrored spheres or fisheye lenses or HDR cameras to capture the lighting. You just have the video feed, which is low dynamic range and it only covers um, about 7% of the field of view of the lighting directions around and not even arguably the most important lighting directions that you need to capture. So this limited field of view of the background is hard to figure out what the lighting in the scene is. And if you don't have the full dynamic range of the light, uh, you'll get a very incorrect result as to what an object would look like. This is this rocket ship uh, lit by a low dynamic range image a clipped version of this lighting environment. Here it is lit with the full dynamic range of the lighting and it's a dramatically different effect. So we thought that since we don't really have all the data we need, we're gonna have to kind of fill it in and make it up and make some educated guesses. And that suggested that we should look at to a machine learning algorithm and to give a machine learning algorithm a good chance to do what we needed to do, we thought we need to record some good training data. And so we built a special custom training data acquisition rig. It has a cell phone that's shooting video, but it's holding some little spheres into the bottom of the frame that tell you what the lighting is 
that goes along with that background. And so you get a lot of footage of images that look like a background plate and then just this little strip at the bottom tells you through the mirror sphere and the diffuse sphere and the, 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 the matte silver sort of glossy sphere. From that, you can figure out everything you need to know about the full dynamic range of the light and you still see most of the rear camera image. So this gives you a lot of training that says, if this is the background, then that's the lighting. And you can just send people out. We built four of these rigs. We sent them to different offices, inside and outside. We've got millions of training frames of lighting all over the place. Here's some of the data that we pulled in. And from that, it is uh, straightforward to those trained in the art to um, set up as a, a training for the, for the network here. This is published uh, at CVPR 2019 by Chloe Legendre et al. Uh, called Deep Light. And if you give it a background, it can then infer and imagine what the high dynamic range light probe would have looked like that you should light a scene with. And these are some results with that rocket ship where we didn't actually measure the light, we just took the background plate from the Pixel phone and then ask Deep Light to figure out what the lighting is and then render this object into the scene. And it generally looks consistent with the lighting that you would get in the scene. Here's another couple of examples you can see. And we're overall pretty happy with that. And that actually shipped as a feature in the AR Core uh, application program interface. So many different AR apps that run on Android phones use this to query the lighting to insert the objects uh, into it. Uh, when we were doing this work, we realized that we were actually pretty careful not to have people in the scenes that we were estimating the lighting from. But it certainly begged the question, like, well, if we knew that there's a person in the scene, uh, you know, all human faces are different, but they certainly have some similarities. Maybe if we knew there was a face in the scene, we'd have an even better idea of what the lighting is like. And we wondered, to what extent could we just use somebody's face as the light probe? to estimate the HDR lighting. And that became a, a project that we showed at SIRGRAPH Asia last year, uh, again, led by Chloe Legendre uh, and some of our, 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 our friends in the augmented perception group here, where we thought that we actually have the perfect way to capture the training data because at Google, we actually built a light stage. And we had brought in, or actually a different project, about 70 people that were you know, different ages, genders, skin tones, uh, dressed differently, different hairstyles. We even had people put on hats and make funny expressions and shot them from different angles. And we got a very large data set of, of, uh, of diverse people. And for each one of these, we lit them from one light direction at a time in our light stage, 331 lighting directions. They were recorded from a lot of different viewpoints. In this project, we used six of them. Uh, so that we kind of have variability, and even if you're not quite frontal, we still have a good way of estimating the lighting. And these are the, the photographed uh, reflectance basis images here. So this is 24 out of our 331 lighting directions. And we know from classic image-based relighting that if you've lit a face with every direction light can come from, you can do the forward process of showing what they'd look like under any lighting environment, just through image recombination of scaling the images to the colors and intensities of the lighting coming from that direction, just adding them all up to produce the effect of what, for example, um, our undergraduate here, uh, HP, would look like lit by the light of Grace Cathedral. And because of this, we can actually generate tons of training data of relit faces that started in our light stage, but we know exactly what we relit them with, so we can tell our network, hey, here's a face, and if you wanted to get the, the answer right for what's the lighting on the face, that's the light that was actually on that face. So we can generate tons of relit faces. And we also take an image that has like a, um, an alpha channel for the face that allows us to uh, composite into the background as well. So these hopefully theoretically look like plausible photos of people lit by the environments that they're being composited into. And then we have you know, the ground truth in all of these cases of what the lighting really was. So that lets us set up a neural network that you put in an input low dynamic range portrait and out can come the, the predicted lighting and you can look at what the real lighting should have been, create a loss function out of that and train your network. So let's take a look at some results. These are some input images here 
Now, these are ones for which we have ground truth. They're not in the wild images yet, but I'll show you those in a second. And we estimated some lighting off of these uh, images. These are other people who we've illuminated with the estimated lighting using forward image-based relighting. And hopefully it looks like, you know, plausibly these two people could be standing next to each other in the same scene and these two people look like they could be standing next to each other in the same scene. Uh, even better is that since we knew the ground truth lighting that we used to generate these two images on the left, we can look at these images on the right and see what they would really look like if we actually let them with the correct answer for the lighting. And this made us really happy. It's pretty darn consistent. All the way down to, you know, the shading, the color tone, and the specular reflections. Um, here you can see this is the ground truth lighting here. This is uh, Yunta, who's someone who worked on our, a lot of the portrait light work uh, at Google. Um, you can see a nice specular reflection in his nose. You can also see a relatively sharp speculate, specular reflection in the lighting that was pulled off of this subject's face. And we were pretty happy with this because it seemed like, you know what, the fact that we're estimating an entire light probe image, it's not super high resolution, but it has some detail to it. It seems to be like we're doing much better than just estimating like spherical harmonic lighting off of a face. And we thought we could test that by just lighting the face with the first two, you know, bands of spherical harmonics, the first nine spherical harmonics in each channel. And you can see if you do that, it's consistent lighting, but it's missing all that specular detail here. Now the nose doesn't have any little shine on it and people look kind of powdered and maybe not quite as lively as they would. So it's like, okay, we are getting some higher frequency components of the lighting off of folks, which is good news. We can do this on video too. This is one of those algorithms where like, okay, we didn't explicitly try to make it temporally stable, but here's Jay Bush. Um, we're estimating the lighting off of her face, not the sphere that she's holding. The sphere is just to give some reference so that you can see it's kind of consistent with what we're estimating uh, there in the spheres. Um, here's another kind of fun thing. We, uh, we had like a digital model of this guy, uh, a friend of ours named Andre, uh, modeled by Ian Spriggs. We thought, let's light this digital model of somebody with uh, lighting we pulled off of some in the wild face. So we pulled lighting off of this, this nice person here. We estimated the lighting. And then we thought, let's light our 3D model with that lighting. And yeah, plausibly, maybe they could actually be there in the same scene together. Maybe Andre and this other guy here that we pulled some lighting off of his face could actually plausibly be there in the same scene. And this also could work for augmented reality. Suppose you're trying to make some fun SIGGRAPH balloons float above your head and you want them lit consistently with the light of the scene, well, if you can pull that lighting off of your face and then light those balloons with that lighting, then maybe those will look integrated into the scene uh, pretty nicely for that. And lighting on faces, you know, this was a fun project because it addressed like kind of a current concern in augmented reality, but also spoke to a really classical problem we've been working on with light stages for a long time, which is trying to light people correctly with the light of the scenes that we're composited, uh, compositing them into. And the very first concept that we had for what to do with the light stage, we finally got to with the um, uh, third light stage that we built is when we, I guess 20 years ago now, surrounded people with red, green, blue color LEDs to light them literally with the light of RGB um, light probe maps and then um, composite them into a, a scene. And here, in this case, we use like an infrared compositing system. And we were able to uh, kind of show by mapping that image-based illumination onto the LEDs, lighting the actor with it, and then compositing them into the scene, plausibly showing uh, our friend Emily here what she would look like if she were standing within San Francisco's Grace Cathedral. And uh, one of the projects that I got to continue to work on at USC ICT as an adjunct faculty member was to build this technology out uh, in a full-blown production system in China, actually. A Chinese visual effects company uh, approached us about building a lighting reproduction light stage for them to do visual effects with. And I got to visit that uh, a couple of years ago. And it's an eight meter stage. It has about a thousand light sources on it. The lights are actually now are multi-spectral. They have white and amber and cyan LEDs in addition to RGB, so you get better color rendition. Some work that Chloe Legendre did for her PhD thesis showed us how to do that. 
And here you can see me visiting the stage one day and visitors, they have this fun trick where they'll uh, composite them into some scene from a Chinese TV show that's already been shot and they'll make you one of the characters uh, in the TV show, which is kind of fun. So they'll, they'll sit you down, they'll, they'll direct you. Fortunately, it's a non-speaking role, um, but you kind of have to react uh, for that. So I'm getting ready to be part of their test. And I'll just show like an image from this here, but this is, this is me um, uh, added into that scene. And since they can reproduce the light of scenes that have already been shot, they can add new people into videos if they weren't there to be for the uh, original shoot. And it turns out that visual effects problem comes up a lot in TV production and movie production. And they've been um, adding actors to scenes with correct lighting um, generated by the light stage for, you know, 70 or 80 shots a day uh, for, for years now, doing a lot of work. This doctor fellow here wasn't originally part of the shoot, and they were able to add him into the scenes because they could reproduce uh, the lighting as accurately as that. This isn't the only professional project that we've kind of worked on lighting reproduction technology with. Um, we had a lot of fun working with uh, the director Alfonso Cuaron with some light stage tests in the R&D phases of a space movie that he made where they knew they would want uh, actors uh, Sandra Bullock and George Clooney to look like they were actually floating out in space, but in fact they were just being filmed in a studio. And this now is a, a pretty pioneering use of LED panels to surround actors with image-based lighting to light them interactively with the light of computer-generated scenes like the space station and the space telescope and the space shuttles and all of that beautiful blue bounce light you get from Earth when you're in space to light their faces so that when they composite them into the digital astronaut suits, it really looks like Sandra Bullock's out there floating in space, spinning out of control. Uh, in, in genuine peril for all the crazy stuff that happens in this movie, Gravity. And the first time this was actually turned into a large-scale production technique was for a Chinese film called Asura that they started in 2016 and released in 2018. And they put huge LED panels all around the walls of the set. Uh, sometimes they can do an in-camera composite. Sometimes they just put a little bit of blue screen in the camera frustum that they're shooting so they can do a traditional composite there. But this technique has now kind of taken Hollywood by storm is what you keep hearing about as virtual production technology. There's even a, a, a Disney project called The Mandalorian, which has been shot uh, to a very significant extent in the surrounding LED panel uh, stages. Um, and they can actually produce a lot of visual effects that would be hard to do otherwise without going on location and do it quicker and more efficiently. In fact, if you just snap your fingers, then you're on to your next set. Now, one thing that doesn't happen immediately is like the floor. They typically have to build out a little bit of the floor for the actor to stand on. You can see here in China, they built a whole patch of grass and flowers and such for this, this hillside scene. Uh, because when the part of the environment that the actors are like directly standing on, there needs to be some sort of photometric interaction with that. And LED panels can show you any color, but they don't necessarily react to what would happen if somebody were standing on it. And particularly, they don't tend to receive shadows or inner reflections. And uh, you know, just for fun, um, at uh, Google, we were playing around with uh, some LED panels that are designed for you to be able to walk on them. Um, and we had like this uh, kind of like 60 centimeter by 60 centimeter um, square of them. We put them in the light stage, and we thought, you know, it would be it would be good to actually generate the shadows that, that you had. I think our future work section of the paper 20 years ago even suggested we should really do like a live 3D scan of your actors and then compute their geometries, shadows that you should have and put them on the, on the scene. I think getting the lag out of that system is gonna be really hard, uh, but we did have a little bit of fun here with uh, Matt Whalen. We, uh, Virtual shadow. we photographed him uh, outside I kind of put some little squares around so we could know exactly what shape here it was. And the idea was that by shooting him from like four angles, we could kind of Photoshop together what the ground looked like around his feet, including the shadows. And then he would just have to stand on those two little footprints. And then we could show the shadows that he would get in there. And when you turn the shadows on, it's a lot more convincing that he's standing on the ground 
and even more fun, when you reproduce the light there using LED lighting of the rest of the scene, the real shadows that you get from that reproduced light are actually consistent with the shadows that are on the, on the ground. So maybe some technology will, will come out of that. Uh, the thing that's particularly future looking though, I think, is that at some point, we won't even really need to light the actors exactly the right way that you need to when you're filming them. Because, you know, why light it during principal production if you can light it in post-production? And that's a project that using the Google Light stage we got to explore with a project that we showed at SIGGRAPH Asia 2019 called The Relightables. And this is a collaboration with the, uh, the Augmented Perception Group and some amazing people there who've worked on depth sensor technology uh, and volumetric capture. And then using our light stage as a computational illumination device, we put time multiplexed illumination into this volumetric capture process in a way that we're not just filming a flat texture map for every frame of their performance, but we're also getting a normal map and to some extent a gloss map for their performance as well. And the way that that works is that we're bouncing between these two lighting conditions that you can see here on the left that are trying to light somebody up like, kind of like a normal map would look. These uh, images, we call them color gradient illumination. And one of them has uh, red light that's bright on the right and then the lights get dimmer as you go to the left. And green light that's a gradient from top to bottom and blue light that's a gradient from front to back. And then the other one uh, shown a 60th of a second later, reverses all that and has the red light go left to right and the green light go bottom to top and the blue light go back to front. If the person doesn't move and you just add those two images together, it's white light from everywhere. Your perfect diffuse texture map that you can use for your geometry. But if you align those images, subtract one from the other and divide by the sum, that math actually basically computes the surface orientation at every point, or it computes the centroid of the area of the light stage whose light is most responsible for the radiance going toward your camera. And that's useful as a photometric normal map that you can use for relighting. And the magnitude of that vector actually is a cue to surface gloss as well, using some techniques that we did at USC ICT back in the day. So the result is that you can put your colleague Christoph into the light stage, He's got some super nicely engineered depth sensors with infrared uh, noise patterns on them. But you saw those two lighting conditions bouncing across. We get a great geometric reconstruction. And then we can use those measures of gloss and normal and albedo to composite him into some fun environments. This is the, the cool Google office uh, in Playa Vista that's actually a place where... Uh, famed American industrialist Howard Hughes built the Spruce Goose airplane, and now we go there for lunch and coffee. Um, and uh, we've added Sergio and Christoph there. This is uh, taking uh, Stephanie, one of our camera engineers, and Jay Bush, uh, our amazing uh, technical artist and so much more, and Matt Whalen, our camera engineer, and just putting them into some CGI scenes as well. Um, and we can show them from any angle and in any lighting. Probably don't have, like, 100% perfect, like, specular reflections, super high resolution frequency. But this is, this is a, a considerable step up from the kind of volumetric capture uh, that's currently commercially available. And uh, we've, been, we've been happy to uh, be able to do some projects with this. This technique of relighting, of course, would be even more practical if you didn't have to put somebody in the light stage. And magically, you could just take a photo of somebody or just take a random selfie and say, oh, I'm not so sure if I like the lighting. Let's, let's see it with some better lighting. And we started to work on that too. And so like the last two little things I've got to show today, one of which is a shift product, is called Portrait Light. And if you think of that data set that I talked about, where we recorded a bunch of people in the light stage, one light at a time reflectance fields, different angles, different clothing, different expressions, that actually allows you to train a network with a whole bunch of examples of, here's a random photo in random lighting with the random background that goes with the lighting. Here's what it looks like if you add a bit more key light from this direction or add a bit more key light from this direction. 
the first thing you might do to fix a lighting in a photo is to add another light source that either accentuates the key light or fills in some of the fill illumination. And we trained a network to imagine that based on the subjects we had so that it can actually work on people it's never seen before and selfies it's never seen before. And this is now a shipping feature in Pixel phones and the Google Photos app called Portrait Light, where after you take your photo, you can go into editing, go for the portrait light feature over here, and it gives you virtual control of a light source you can move around your face that will augment the lighting that's already there. And you can improve the lighting in your photograph. Tons of people are using this and, and it's gotten great feedback so far. It doesn't let you completely start from scratch on the lighting. You can't throw in a different background and start completely anew. But as a little preview of what we'll talk about at SIGGRAPH this year in just a month or two, uh, we've worked on just that. We've worked on an algorithm called total relighting. And here we're talking about total relighting not only because the lighting that we're going to do is going to allow us to start from scratch and light it absolutely with any HDR map that we want, but also that we're going to replace the background as well. So we have to get a really good alpha channel for this in the wild selfie. And the image here on the left, totally in the wild selfie photo, and we are demonstrating being able to change the lighting pretty much arbitrarily with any HDRI map in any orientation and then composite it into a new background. So I will uh, leave the, uh, the, the co-authors for that project uh, some things to talk about at uh, SIGGRAPH, but it still uses this uh, data set. Um, the, the real key here is that we're uh, turning our data into... Uh, first of all, kind of an unlighting operation where we figure out uh, estimates of the person's unlit appearance of what they would look like under flat lighting and what their normal map would look like and what their gloss map would look like at different roughnesses. And then we train networks to uh, regress to those and then also use those in conjunction with the original photo to predict what the lighting would look like uh, in the new environment. And that brings us to the end of what I have brought to talk about uh, today. Thanks for the opportunity. Let me thank some of the, all of the co-authors, some of the, the, the people that I've uh, gotten to work with here who have helped support the work at uh, Google. There's some websites there. And if I've left any time for questions, I'm happy to take a couple of uh, questions. Otherwise, please follow up on email. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you. That was an incredible body of work. Um, you showed us so much, and I think we have time for... Uh, just a couple of questions. So uh, one thing that I really loved about all of the things that you showed us was uh, sort of the the multiple scales. So we saw these giant light stages. We saw it working on a cell phone camera. We saw you doing things with, you know, little $2 mirrors. Uh, and then for your poster, you sort of split the difference really nicely with Brutus, which is like a sort of intermediate trade-off. Um, and I guess I was sort of wondering, you know, there's sort of this idea that we have for most problems of a, of a cost performance space. And it seems like you've really spanned that space really well. Um, but I guess I was wondering, you know, we, we sort of look for sweet spots in this space and, and you've got the perspective sort of uh, from the academic side, from the sort of Google side, but then also maybe from the Hollywood side. Uh, does that space look different from those perspectives? Yeah, it does. And it varies a lot by project uh, as well. Um, you know, we had, uh, we, we had an opportunity to potentially work on, on this TV show called The Game of Thrones at one point because they, uh, they have these uh, uh, very large wolves in their story. And they thought that they could do something with like digitizing real wolves in the light stage. And then they could just scale them up by whatever factor, insert them in the scene, relight them. They could do the visual effects that way. And we did a test. We wanted to make sure like it wouldn't uh, bother a wolf or, 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 or a canine to have the flashing lighting. So we did like a little test with them of a German Shepherd uh, to see how they'd react. German Shepherd was fine. And um, we thought, it's like, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. And uh, it was just the very first season of that show. They didn't have huge budgets yet. And they didn't even really want to spend even $5,000 to capture some wolves. It was like, like, okay, there's no budget. It's like, we can't, we, we, we can't have wolves in our lab for under $5,000. That doesn't make sense. So, um, you know, sometimes Hollywood budgets are, are small, sometimes they're, they're big. Hollywood definitely doesn't want to spend any more money on anything than, than they have to. And they spend a lot of money on people whose job it is to not spend money on stuff. 
or to not let anyone else spend any money on anything. Um, at Google, you know, we were very lucky to basically build the light stage of our dreams uh, at Google with you know, the depth sensors, uh, there's about 100 cameras on it. We enlarged it so it could be both a, a body capture system and a, and a face capture system. Uh, and it's done great stuff for us. But I don't think we would have felt comfortable just building that as our first version. It helped that the very first light stage had a single light pulled by ropes and it was, you know, me as a postdoc spending about a thousand dollars at Home Depot to, to, to build that. And, um, you know, there's a saying at Google, solve before you scale. And if there's any, like, you know, may, maybe a takeaway, there is really a lot of benefit to do the little experiments. Those are fun. And then bring it up like, you know, one notch at a time until it gets to the right uh, solution for the right problem. What, a, what an amazing and rich history. Um, one, one other question I had was about sort of the light probes that you use. So I loved the, the, the little mock-up you had of just, you know, put three spheres on a cell phone camera and it's just such a beautiful and elegant way to solve this problem. And then the fact that you were able to use a face essentially as a light probe was kind of shocking because, you know, there's self-occlusion, there's subsurface scattering, there's, you know, differences in opacity. It seemed like some of the people you were using were wearing cosmetics, which are almost sort of designed to fool you in that. Um, so is this something where uh, it works because you're um, just going for something that's sort of plausible looking rather than physically accurate, or is this something where maybe some of those challenges can actually help you? Uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a, it's a good question. The, the the spheres in the in the cell phone rig are you know they're just like holiday ornaments, which are super cheap. No one sells diffuse holiday ornaments because those would be boring. So you have to get some Rust-Oleum primer paint and paint those. It's very Lambertian, so. Um, th th that was pretty, you know, straightforward to make. Another nice uh, build by Jay Bush there, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're not always estimating completely the right lighting. Something that was like really worrisome about that is that sometimes when you're walking uh, like out of a building, you know, you you now see a, a view in your cell phone that's like the outdoors, but the spheres haven't yet gone outdoors completely yet, or they're still in the shadow of the building. So you'll get completely contradictory information as to what the lighting for that scene should be right before the spheres go into the sunlight and then right after they go into the sunlight. And you know what, we just threw it into the network and I don't know what the network does, but it comes up with pretty plausible stuff, right? I mean, we're not, we're not competing with anything particularly good in terms of what the lighting estimation algorithms were, were before. And in, to some sense, to a person looking at that image, there isn't much information in the image that the person has access to either to see whether it's correct or not. So, you know, that maybe we're doing okay for that. Uh, in the case of faces, the, the biggest concern that we had is that any like naive algorithm to estimate lighting off of a face might be proportional. It might estimate an amount of light that's proportional to the, to the reflectivity of the skin. And you might estimate more light in the scene if there's a lighter skin tone and less light in the scene if there's a darker skin tone. And that would not be good ML fairness. It wouldn't be the right answer, certainly. Um, we trained, you know, we specifically tried to bring people in with, with, a, with a, a healthy range of skin tones in the light stage. We trained on that. There is some uh, information available, you know, about, about skin tone in the data, like diffuse specular ratios kind of tag that a little bit. But we just let the network try to figure it out and it did great. You saw in those examples, we were estimating lighting off of a person with one skin tone, reproducing it on a person on another skin tone, and then actually reproduced how they would look in the light that was consistent the way they'd look under the ground truth illumination. So we were very happy that, you know, machine learning did the job on that. Excellent, thank you. And we have, I guess, one last question from the live chat. Um, Sang Juan Bach says, thanks for the amazing talk. Could you please talk about your vision on how the future of the light stage would look in terms of its capability? Oh, awesome. Wow. Well, <laughs> I mean, we've, we, we, I, I've been involved in building light stages for, for 20, 20 years now. And, uh, you know, I mean, maybe I should figure out something else to do, but, um, you know, the, the, the the application in the area of virtual production is very interesting uh, because essentially what folks are doing when they're building these LED panels all around the actors, they're building a form of a light stage. It's higher resolution, um, 
the spectral rendition isn't you know, state of the art because these LED panels are designed to be displays, not light sources, not illuminance. And so they don't care about their color rendition. They can produce any color you can see, but they can't produce the color rendition effects of any spectrum of light that you'd probably want to light somebody with. Uh, in particular, uh, they're missing a, a gap of spectrum, like between the red LED and the green LED, it doesn't produce any legitimately yellow light in between. And that area of the spectrum is where human skin starts to absorb the shorter wavelengths due to hemoglobin. That's like the one piece of high frequency content in the human reflectance spectrum. And they mismatch in a somewhat biased way. It tends to make people look a bit too color saturated and a bit too magenta. So that's kind of a, a major minus when you're surrounded by these beautiful LEDs and everybody looks a little too pink. Uh, that's actually something that happens. You have to do some color correction. So that would be nice if we could address that somehow, um, probably better LEDs in there. And another huge problem is dynamic range because um, you might notice that in some of these you know, shows like in The Mandalorian, um, they're, they're often trying to set up the scene so the actors just happen to be sitting in the shadow of a rock or a shadow of their spaceship uh, or it's at twilight. And whenever they need to show people in full sunlight, they, they tend to actually shoot that on the, on the back lot and not in the LED stage because the dynamic range of LEDs, to, to show that little disc of the sun on the LEDs, they'd have to go well over a thousand times brighter than they actually can. So thinking about how to address that problem would be, would be of interest as well. So I, I think in that context of these, you know, tons of these stages are getting built. It would be great if they covered as many of the production cases as people are really going to want them to. So that's something to think about. Gotcha. Okay, so now with these LEDs that you can stand on and these really nice LED panels that you're going to make, is the future of acting just you go into a little light closet and you talk to yourself? It could be that, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be a little bit more like theater. Um, you know, it, it, it sounds maybe attractive to, like, go on location to, you know, Tahiti or... Or, or, or Moscow or something and shoot your scenes there. But, you know, you're away from your family. You've got jet lag. There's tons of production issues. You're stuck in a hotel. Um, a, a lot of folks, you know, who are like working actors and directors love the idea that they can, you know, go to a set that's, you know, in the same place every day. They can work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or whatever uh, and kind of turn acting into more of a normal job instead of like a complete life derailment. And the promise of these stages where you snap your fingers and all of a sudden you're in any location that you need to be in uh, is very attractive for that. So I think that that's going to be pushing the adoption as well. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for, for sharing and for closing us out. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, watching our other speakers, our poster presenters. Um, looking forward to seeing you guys hopefully in person soon. And we'll just close out with a few comments from our co-organizers. Thanks so much.